so good morning good morning uh, all of you uh, i rashmi rameshwari from department of biotechnology welcome you all in today's in webinar series part 3 and uh, in today's uh, webinar we have a distinguished guest uh, and speaker she is dr bhavna murli dharan along with her uh, professor kanan has also joined today and uh, she is chair professor in department of biotechnology as well as he is uh, chairman in support task force so he will also throw some light and uh, as we know that this is our uh, third lecture series and uh, we have started uh, and uh, in a very uh, well way and uh, uh, our lectures are uh, going on very smoothly uh, we have learned a lot uh, in from our last uh, lecture so hope uh, in today's uh, webinar also we will come up with uh, some uh, good information so uh, before that i would like to uh, welcome our guest dr bhavna murli dharan and uh, i want to give you her brief profile how she uh, came up to this position uh, right now uh, dr bhavna is a uh, assistant investigator at uh, with dbt welcome india alliance at institute for stem cell science and regenerative medicine at bangalore she has come up with a very excellent education background she completed her btech in biotechnology from guru gobind singh indraprasth university after completing her btech biotechnology she did her mtech from uh, guru gobind singh indraprasth university and after completing her uh, mtech again she moved for her higher education she pursued phd phd from pune uh, national center for cell science pune and uh, after completion of her phd she got a very good opportunity to do her post doctor fellowship uh, with cifr mumbai and she did her post doc fellow under welcome trust dbt alliance Uh, early career fellow after completion of her this post doc again she got chance to work at uk dementia research institute at ucl london she did uh, her second post doc there and uh, in the meantime she received various research grant from csir welcome trust dbt india alliance early career fellowship embo and dbt funding for organizing 2021 india embo lecture course on modeling develop, uh, development and disease with human tissue organoid presently she is having grant of dbt welcome trust india alliance intermediate career fellowship so with this excellent uh, background she grabbed many awards as well in 2003 she was silver medalist when she completed her btech in 2004 she again received gold medal uh, in uh, her mtech in 2016 she received ibro sfn travel award to attend sfn usa in 2020 again she got another award that was japanese neuroscience society travel award to attend jns 2020 meeting at hope japan so with uh, this excellent uh, career background uh, educational background uh, dr bhavna has presented many posters and papers she has published in reputed journal and uh, he is specialized in neuroscience and we know that in this covid time uh, covid is not affecting only our health uh, our physics it is affecting our mental health as well so nowadays patients not only you can say that patients they die because of shock but as a normal human like human being are also affected a lot due to this covid uh, uh thing so it is a time that we should know that how it is affecting our nervous system our brain and uh, it is actually making us uh, depressed at that this time because the infection is uh, uh, still going up day by day 
sure now uh, i would like to welcome dr aha uh, as uh, she will give you she will do uh, a live on covid treatment uh, and uh, infection so welcome amna over to you now uh thank you so much rashmi thank you so much for this very very elaborate and warm introduction and uh, good morning to you all though i cannot see you uh, but i'm sure all of you are listening and thank you so much for joining um, this morning uh, to this webinar where i'll be today talking about um, how the world is tackling covid 2019 um and uh, tell you what is the biology behind some of these promising diagnostics and treatments uh which are being offered uh needless to say covid 2019 um is one of the gravest public health care uh which the world has seen and so has india uh um and um, it is one of its kinds in the recent times and uh, one of the things which i think which this covid 2019 has revealed um uh if you ask the question uh the first thing it has revealed is the repurposing of uh, existing resources to battle the pandemic uh be it the frontline healthcare workers or your doctor or the policeman or the delivery boy all of us have repurposed our existing physical resources and existing skill sets to sort of battle or tackle this pandemic there is another important thing which has come up in this pandemic and that is the importance of science or rather um in the words of santosh desai who's a columnist at the times of india um the return of science this pandemic has revealed or emphasized the importance of science and its way to the general public we as scientists knew what was the importance we also knew what was the ways but now with this live human experiment which is happening not just in india but across the globe we are now getting used to the ways of science and its ways of problem solving what is it revealed as scientists what fascinate and as a scientist myself what fascinates me towards science is the fact that we are able to dig deep and find fundamental answers now the world is seeing this that if there is a problem like covid 2019 a pandemic it is now important for science to dig deep and find fundamental answers and cures to this and find cure to this um, pandemic but not just that it has also revealed the ways of science many people um, you know don't understand that science is an elaborate process and it requires several steps we are because in this day and age of social media we are used to instant gratification we are in, used to instant solutions what science has revealed is that this entire process of science is iterative that is it is repetitive and it is quite rigorous also there are always small incremental steps towards the ultimate solution and these small incremental steps are all not coming from the same labs but perhaps the collaborative effect efforts of multiple labs across the globe this also has shown that there are several setbacks or misjudgments which also happen during this process particularly if there is a time constraint there are going to be certain uncertainties or misjudgments or you know uh, um, setbacks and this has actually led to a lot of retractions which we are seeing in in the course of last several months and all of this finally there is an expectation that there'll be a breakthrough but i must warn and tell everybody that there is all there is only going to be a possibility of a breakthrough and today in my talk i'm going to talk uh, tell you exactly this that how all these steps of science have been revealed uh, as we look for diagnostics and treatments for covid 2019 well we just not stop there but this pandemic has also taught us that there is a need for translational science now what is translational science simply put it is uh coming from the bench going to the bench side as you can see uh in this cartoon here uh the scientist does basic discoveries in the lab uh there is a need that these basic discoveries find applications so that we can now create therapies procedures or diagnostics which can be applied to the patient or uh, or patient who's at the bed side this pandemic has now asked us to do more of science which is translational in nature and not just basic in nature because the emergency or the pandemic is asking us to be like that 
Uh, just to give you an example that in 2018, there was a case study done uh, where uh, um, they looked at what are the per what is the percentage of, you know, NIH RON funding uh, in basic research in a field of uh, behavioral science. And uh, uh, I mean, would you like to take a guess that what could have been the percentage? The percentage is actually only 4% of basic research awards uh, in the field of behavioral and social science research was translational. So clearly cut to 2020, uh, I mean, this will not solve the problem of COVID 2019 if this basic research is not um, uh, becoming translational. So the two key things which have come out from this pandemic to, according to me, are the need for science and the need for translational science. And my own research institute, the um, uh, INSTEM, which is the Institute for Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine, is a theme-based interdisciplinary research which does clinical and translational science. Uh, as I uh, mentioned, we are a theme-based research institute. We have several themes. Uh, as you can see here, this is our website. Uh, we are funded by the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, we have several different themes. Uh, the theme to which I belong to is the brain development and disease mechanisms. Uh, whereas we have the Center for Cardiovascular Biology, uh, we have the Center for Inflammation and Tissue Homeostasis, we have Integrative Chemical Biology, and we have a Center for Stem Cell Research. So each theme uh, under its mandate conducts research which, uh, you know, utilizes uh, clinical samples or which asks and answers questions which are important for diseases. Uh, my own work pertains to understanding neurodevelopmental disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The cardiovascular uh, biology team uh, works towards understanding cardiomyopathy. The stem cell research is focused towards creating stem cell therapies for blood related disorders. The integrated chemical biology is looking towards developing drugs for um, um, uh, disorders, uh, many disorders. looks at inflammation in skin and lungs. We all come together uh, at the level of the Institute and uh, intermingle with one another. And this is a collaborative effort towards uh, doing translational science in the country. Uh, now coming to the topic of my talk today um, uh, is that um, what are the diagnostics or what are the treatments which are currently available for uh, understanding or for, uh, for studying or uh, for the COVID 2019 uh, pandemic? So before going there, I would like to briefly tell you what is the basic biology of the SARS-CoV-2 infection? Because as I mentioned, it is a basic biology which drives uh, translational science. Uh, as we know that there are seven coronaviruses which affect humans and four of them cause uh, uh, just affect the nose and the throat and they cause cold like symptoms. But there are three coronaviruses uh, of which uh, two have already uh, sort of uh, the world had seen. Uh, start at the start of two, uh, in 2003 onwards, the SARS coronavirus or the MERS coronavirus. And these both, which caused SARS and MERS respectively, they served as one warnings for what was about to come. And the third coronavirus, which, uh, which uh, is now causing the glo global pandemic of COVID-2019, the SARS-CoV-2 is a third kind of coronavirus, which not just uh, infect the nasal and the throat uh, epithelium, uh, but also the lung epithelium, leading to a lot of pulmonary distress, um, uh, which leads to acute uh, respiratory uh, syndromes. Uh, now, before we go into studying uh, what kind of diagnostics are being made for the SARS coronavirus, uh, it is important to understand or look into what is the structure of this coronavirus. The coronavirus, as uh, it uh, comes from the name itself, is a virus uh, which, you know, has a corona-like uh, appearance and that is primarily given by the spike proteins which are present on uh, the envelope of this um, uh, virus. Uh, besides the coronavirus, what it has, this is an RNA virus. So it has the um, uh, RNA genome which is uh, uh, encapsulated inside a nucleocapsid protein. It also has membrane proteins, it has a uh, lipid membrane, and uh, this structure of the SARS coronavirus um, um, uh, is important for its entry uh, into the uh, lung epithelium via the spike protein, and, and I'll come to that in a bit. 
Uh, so what is the mode of infection of this coronavirus? Uh, so this coronavirus, uh, the spike protein on this coronavirus interacts with the ACE2 receptor, which is present in the lung epithelium. Uh, it is here in this cartoon, it is shown um, um, a bit more uh, that this uh, spike protein actually consists of two subunits, the S1 and S2, which actually interact with the uh, ACE2 uh, receptor. And uh, uh, there is a clathrin mediated endocytosis, which happens. I'll not go into the details of which, perhaps you have uh, you know, um, understood this from a previous webinar uh, uh, in which uh, some of these basics were discussed with you. So this uh, 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 SARS coronavirus enters the lung epithelium um, uh, uh, via the ACE2 receptor and where uh, the RNA genome of this uh, coronavirus is then translated using host machinery. Uh, uh, and then that leads to the production of the various COVID-19 proteins, uh, which uh, the, some of the important proteins which the virus requires for its infection are the spike protein, the membrane protein, uh, the nucleocapsid protein, n envelope protein, and several other structural proteins which is required for its infection or for the maintaining its integrity. Once these proteins are made, uh, they also uh, uh, they self replicate. They form more virus particles, which then come out of the lung epithelium and infects other cells. But what goes on within the lung epithelium is the fact that some of these viral proteins uh, lead to the you know triggering of an inflammatory response inside the lung epithelium. Uh, which leads to a production of several uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, the prominent amongst them being IL-1B, which leads to the influx of calcium, which leads to the up activation of caspases, which also leads to mitochondrial damage, and thereby there is a cytokine storm, which then leads to a respiratory distress. Uh, also, because the uh, ACE2 receptor is being shed from the, lung, uh, from the uh, cells, uh, that also uh, leads to, because of reduction in ACE2 receptor, leads to a respiratory distress. Uh, why am I telling you about all of these, um, you know, pathways or the structure of the coronavirus? Is that uh, only because we understand uh, some of these uh, pathways and some of these um, uh, structures from previous infections like SARS and MERS? that we now know uh, what could be some of the uh, diagnostics which can be designed to uh, uh, study the COVID-2019 infection or what can be the therapies which can be designed against some of these pathways. Okay, now an aside uh, uh, and just because I want to, you know, uh, emphasize here that science is conducted by scientists and it's very important to give, uh, you know, recognition where it is due. Uh, um, as of today, people understand uh, the discoverer of the coronavirus uh, to be uh, David Tyrrell, Malcolm Bino, and June Almeida from uh, Great Britain. Professor P. Balram, who, was, uh, who is an ex-director of ISC and who is currently a faculty at NCBS, asked the same question that who is the discoverer of coronavirus? And he accidentally chanced upon the finding that uh, these three people from Great Britain are not the only ones who discovered coronavirus. Rather, uh, we also have a virologist uh, by the name of Dorothy Hamre, uh, who was at University of Chicago, and she was the first one to isolate a strain of coronavirus, which she named it as 229E in the year 1966. And this was around the same time when uh, Tyrell, Bino, and Almeida were uh, uh, looking at the trans um, TEM structure of the coronavirus. And this is her paper, uh, which she published in uh, 1966. And uh, she is, uh, you know, a very good uh, virologist who goes on to, uh, who went on to do uh, work in several, uh, understanding uh, the mode of infection of several viruses, not just the coronavirus. But uh, this a picture here is the first TEM ever of a coronavirus and this is from the work of June Almeida and she is widely being celebrated as the uh, person who first uh, identified the coronavirus 
Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it is important here to note that the virus which was used by June Almeida and uh, Tyrell were actually given by Dorothy Hamray. And till now, uh, all, all of these peoples were just names, but I think uh, we should pause at this moment and give a face to all of these people who've been pioneers. And today, uh, whenever we see a coronavirus, I think we should also remember the contributions by June Almeida, who uh, was an expert at viral imaging, and also Dorothy Hamry, who was a fantastic experimental biologist who gave the viruses to uh, June to conduct some of these studies. Right. Uh, now, going to uh, looking at uh, what are the uh, widely used diagnostics in the COVID 2019 pandemic? Uh, the first widely used diagnostic is uh, that of uh, detection of the viral RNA by RT PCR. This is the most preferred and sensitive and specific technique amongst all. And today, world over, uh, most of the laboratories or perhaps um, 98 to 99 percent of the laboratories uh, do their testing using this RT-PCR method. The second method is a rapid method, uh, which is also quite specific, uh, specific uh, say up to 95 percent uh, specificity. That is detection of antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2. How does the first technique, that of detection of viral RNA by RT-PCR work? Right. So um, the RT-PCR based detection of viral RNA is basically starts with uh, taking uh, of a nasal swab. Um, uh, and this is done by, uh, you know, uh, doctors at uh, hospitals. This swab, uh, which is taken from uh, the nasopharyngeal uh, path um, airway, is then immediately uh, collected in a viral transfer medium. Uh, and uh, it is immediately transferred to a testing center uh, where um, um, uh, 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 under cold conditions so that the virus is still intact so that, you know, at the testing center, the viral RNA can be isolated. At the testing center, and I'll uh, be coming to that, that uh, uh, my institute uh, uh, along with NCBs is also a testing center. Uh, what do we do here is that we uh, uh, aliquot a portion of this uh, viral transfer medium which contains the virus and we add a lysis buffer to this, uh, you know, to this mix to uh, sort of uh, degrade the um, viral coat proteins but keep the viral RNA intact. And all of this is conducted under, you know, uh, uh, strict safety measures like a biosafety L2 plus safety hoods and with people wearing all the protective uh, uh, protective equipments. Then this uh, viral RNA is isolated uh, by standard column based uh, methods or bead based methods. And once this RNA is isolated, uh, an RT-PCR reaction is set up where uh, one or more of these viral genes are detected using qPCR based methods. Um, I mean, several kits use combinations of uh, some of these genes, which I've named here, uh, namely the envelope. Uh, uh, the primers will be designed against detecting the envelope um, RNA or, or the nucleocapsid or the spike or very commonly the RNA dependent RNA polymerase is also used, the RDRP and also the ORF1 gene. Now, a very important control here is the fact that uh, this um, isolate or this, um, you know, swab which we take uh, uh, should also contain human cells. Uh, and as an internal control to check whether the RNA has been isolated properly, we also include something like a, a gene, uh, a primer which detects the RNA P gene from the human. So this is a very important human con uh, internal control, which tells us that uh, the presence of the human cells and along with it, whether there are the viral uh, genes are also present or not. A qPCR reaction is set uh, and this amplification plot here and based on thresholds, uh, a threshold dependent on the kit being used, a threshold is set uh, which will. Yeah, a threshold is set which will tell you whether uh, say suppose the cutoff is say 40 CT value. Uh, anything which is less than 40 CT value will say the presence of the viral gene and anything above 
the threshold. Uh, I mean, this is just an example. Uh, uh, 40 CT value will tell you that the virus is absent. And uh, these are the various curves for the RNA-sp gene and the several different viral genes which, uh, which is detected. And as I mentioned to you, uh, my own institute uh, in STEM uh, along with NCBS uh, has, uh, is uh, now uh, uh, started a diagnostic cent testing center. And I will here emphasize the fact that uh, we never did diagnostic testing center ever uh, at our institute. And uh, to give an example how I have, we have repurposed ourselves is, is that in a very short time, we have set up the entire modules uh, for doing this. Um, uh, uh, the modules are various, as I, was, uh, I mentioned to you that, uh, you know, there are several steps to this process. The process begins uh, at the hospital with the swab and it comes to us in this uh, vial, uh, in the viral transfer medium, uh, where our job starts from aliquoting, uh, which happens in, uh, you know, a very, a safe environment. Uh, uh, then the RNA extraction also happens in a safe environment that is under safety hoods, followed by the PCR. Again, it is conducted in safety hoods, uh, followed by a team which uh, sets the PCR and the team which analyzes the data. And here I show you pictures as we work. And this is a picture on the extreme left, uh, which was taken by the aliquoting team. You can see all of them are wearing uh, the protective equipment and in their hands are, you know, placards uh, which when uh, they took when we did our 10,000 sample at the testing center. And I'm very proud and happy to say that we have conducted over 16,000 tests in the past two months, uh, uh, two and a half months. And uh, this once the aliquoting team uh, sends it over to our team, which is the RNA extraction team. And I've been uh, he, uh, in the RNA extraction team in a supervisory role at my center. And as you can see here, they're inside the hoods extracting the RNA, which then goes to the PCR team. And this is uh, the team which sets the PCR on the qPCR machines. And there is a dedicated team, uh, which is the data operating team, which matches every patient's data to, uh, 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 to an ID. And that ID is being tracked from as the sample moves uh, in real time from one team over to the other. Um, I mean, uh, this happens nonstop at our center 24 seven. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're very proud to say that we have tested samples all over Karnataka. And here I show you a, a graphic that, you know, our samples come from as far as North Karnataka from Bidar. And uh, we do uh, a lot of samples in, uh, in Bangalore. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a prime example of how, how we repurposed our science and we got together as an institute, as a collaborative effort to do this uh, diagnostic set uh, testing uh, uh, at our place. And we use the RT-PCR method to do this. Right now, also um, a very important thing is the fact that uh, um, uh, there is something called pooling, which happens um, at the level uh, uh, by our side at the time of aliquoting. Uh, you would have heard of the term pooling uh, in, uh, in news and uh, that ICMR also suggests that we should do pooling uh, because uh, that way you can uh, speed up the process. You can also, um, you know, uh, decrease the cost of doing these tests. So routine or simple pooling uh, actually involves uh, simple pooling is simply that you take five patients and pool their samples in one tube. Similarly, you take other five patients, pull their sample in one tube, uh, and then you extract RNA from such single tubes, which are uh, pooled samples from five, five patients. And then you uh, see whether, you know, uh, uh, whether there are any viral uh, gene which has been detected in each of these uh, pooled samples. Now, uh, uh, if all of them are negative, very well, we can report that, you know, all the patients which we tested, suppose we started with 1000 patients and uh, we pulled them in five fives and we did 200 tests. Uh, and if all 200 tests comes out to be uh, negative, then we can report, say, all 1000 people were negative. Now, this is a very good scenario when the percentage infectivity is low. And this was very good for us when we began the testing, because at the start of the testing, the percentage infectivity was really indeed low, less than even 1%. Uh, 
But as uh, you know, uh, uh, the pandemic progresses and uh, we're talking about uh, the peaking of the pandemic um, uh, in several different countries at different times, this infection rate can go up to 10%. So in such a scenario, imagine that if there is a 10% chance of infectivity, then what we may end up is all of uh, most of these tubes being positive and then we'll have to so once what happens is if one of these tubes turn out to be positive, we then individually extract all the five samples, uh, individually extract the RNA from them and then do a PCR to see whether which sample from this was actually positive. Now, if we were to do the simple pooling, what we'll end up doing is in a case of high infectivity, like 10 percent, we'll end up actually repeating the PCR again. Uh, we'll have to do some uh, 200, uh, 100 more tests in the second round if there is a 10 percent infectivity. Uh, to sort of, uh, you know, a scientist uh, to sort of uh, uh, to uh, uh, come up with an intelligent solution to this, uh, scientists at IIT Madras, uh, Dr. Manoj Gopalakrishnan, Sandeep Krishna at NCBS, and Dasaradi Palkodeti at INSTEM. They've come up with a combined sensing algorithm, which they call as tapestry or the smart way of pooling. Uh, this is designed uh, so that, you know, you don't when the infectivity is high, you don't end up doing multiple rounds of PCR. And rather, can we now come up with a design where with a single round of PCR, can we then say that, you know, uh, there is uh, which sample, which of these samples could be positive. And this is simple, uh, a mathematical model where uh, it is assumed uh, based on a probability that if you randomly pool samples and not just uh, uh, as opposed to uh, pooling five samples in one tube and the next five samples in one tube, if you rather assign each sample to uh, more than one tube or rather two tubes, uh, uh, two or three tubes at a time and you pool it in this way, uh, uh, based on an uh, algorithm which simply uses probability uh, to determine which, sam which sample should go into which tubes, what you will end up is uh, uh, an algorithm which after we do the test, uh, the machine can then determine uh, after looking at positives that which of these samples were, you know, could have been uh, positive. And um, this is currently only at the algorithm stage and being tested uh, uh, by way of experiments uh, from our own uh, at our own testing center to see whether you know such an algorithm uh, will be very useful when the infection rates are very very high uh, uh, very very high because then you will uh, only do 100 tests in one round per thousand sample as opposed to doing 200 tests in two rounds so we save time and we also save money two of the things which are very very crucial um, uh, at this stage of the pandemic right uh, now going to uh, the second um, uh, sort of uh, 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 method for a diagnostic, which is an antibody uh, based detection of the host immune response. So I come back again to the structure of the SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is a single standard RNA uh, uh, genome. And as you can see that there is this uh, spike protein. And uh, uh, if you remember from a few slides before, I said that the moment this, um, uh, sorry, I'll go back so that, yeah. So the moment the spike, uh, the viral enters the um, uh, uh, epithelium or the cell, there is a, you know, inflammatory response which is uh, generated inside the cell. And that leads to production of antibodies. Uh, And that leads to production of antibodies. Uh, 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 both IgM and IgG, uh, the IgM is produced in the acute phase of the infection that as soon as the infection starts on day zero, uh, the uh, IgM antibodies are being produced. And then the IgG antibodies are produced in the co convalescent phase of the infection. So these antibodies can then be detected uh, using an ELISA uh, based uh, method for detection of antibodies. And this device here uh, sh shows that how you could do it. Uh, basically what you would need from a patient is now a blood sample uh, where, you know, uh, a blood sample or a plasma from the patient, which then uh, will be put in a, a flow device like this for detection of, uh, you know, both the IgG and IgM antibodies. 
Uh, now, though this test is quite rapid and uh, the time taken for doing this test uh, is uh, reduced, uh, but I must mention here that, you know, um, why this test is not a very popular test uh, uh, given uh, 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 worldwide uh, for the current pandemic and why it is still world over the RT-PCR based test which is being uh, used widely to detect for the viral RNA. And this graphic here, uh, though, is a bit crowded, and I'll walk you through the uh, graphic, and which will precisely tell you why it is important right now to do most of our detections using PCR and not the antibody. Though this kit uh, is being widely developed world over for uh, specifically detecting the SARS-CoV-2 spike, uh, spike protein. So uh, what this graph here shows is that upon uh, the SARS-CoV-2 exposure, what immediately is detected and here uh, the, the line in blue is the PCR uh, whereas and this is the you know uh, virus uh, which is being isolated from the respiratory tract. So at, at this e stage even before the symptoms can be seen what you can actually detect is the presence of the viral RNA and that this PCR very beautifully detects and it goes on to detect once the symptoms also start to show and uh, uh, start to show. And uh, uh, as you can see that week one and two when the symptoms show. So patients usually come to us with the symptoms. So at this stage, there are actually no antibodies which are detected in their uh, blood. So it is very important that most of our tests, because right now we want to curtail this pandemic. Uh, we want to do a test to be sure that you know the person is positive. So that's why the PCR based uh, detection methods are preferred because they are the ones which are more sensitive at this stage of the infection. Uh, the I and the dotted lines here show the uh, when the um, IgM or the IgG antibodies can be seen in the serum and uh, which is uh, starts from week two uh, and that's why uh, these are not this method is not a very popular and not currently widely used method for detection. Uh, of course, besides the fact that the sensitivity and the specificity of this method of detection is also uh, lower than the RT-PCR based kit. All right. So um, um, here I would like to uh, pause and mention about uh, one other way of detecting SARS-CoV-2 uh, because um, I mean, to begin with, uh, the uh, moment the pandemic hit worldwide, the first response was, uh, I mean, can we use whatever we have with us to start doing testing uh, and then go on to look at treatments? But of course, uh, the RT-PCR method is quite laborious. It takes several hours and it requires, uh, you know, specialized equipment like the qPCR machine. Uh, I mean, as I showed you myself that our, at our own testing center, we've been doing this as a dedicated team nonstop. Uh, we have about 80 to 100 volunteers uh, at the center, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, on a daily basis. So it requires a very dedicated team to, you know, the, do this kind of diagnostics. Uh, but people are now coming up with other ways of detecting the SARS coronavirus, ways in which this uh, entire process can be reduced from hours to minutes, ways in which the cost of this can be reduced by about three to five times. And I must mention one diagnostic uh, which uh, actually has come from the labs of Debajyoti Chakraborty and Sovik Maiti at IGIB and shows a great promise and utilizes the CRISPR-Cas based system. I must mention here that there are several CRISPR-Cas based systems, uh, 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 including from the labs of Feng Zhang, uh, which are based on Sherlock or which are uh, based on detect methods. And uh, I would here like to, you know, talk about the Feluda method uh, which has come uh, from IGIB. Uh, now, Feluda, as um, I mean, I'm not sure if, if any of you are familiar with uh, Satyajit Ray's uh, uh, novel on Feluda, who is a detective, and precisely this uh, technique here is also uh, used for detecting SARS coronavirus. Uh, actually, Feluda uh, in this case stands for uh, FN Cas9 Editor Linked Uniform Detection Assay. Uh, how does this assay work? Uh, this assay also uses the same uh, nasopharyngeal swab containing the virus, uh, which then from which the viral RNA is isolated. And post this, uh, the difference being uh, 
uh, instead of actually uh, going ahead and doing any RT-PCR reaction, uh, um, oh, sorry, instead of going ahead and doing any qPCR reaction, the cDNA, the RT-PCR is done with uh, uh, primers which are bitonylated. Uh, so, which means that these primers, which are bitonylated, can now be detected using streptavidin. Now, uh, the uh, the FN Cas9 uh, is, um, you know, a Cas9 which detects, uh, you, uh, which uh, cleaves when whenever there is a, uh, uh, which cleaves only when there is an absolute, you know, binding of the guide RNA to that of the target RNA. Even if there is a single base mismatch, this uh, Cas9 will not work. Uh, and that is the method by which the detection happens. Uh, so uh, what the um, um, team has generated is actually generated a sort of a strip which contains the streptavidin, um, uh, you know, um, uh, streptavidin bound target RNA. And the cDNA, which is isolated from the uh, viral RNA is then incubated on these strips. Wherever there is complete match with that of the viral RNA, uh, the, the FN Cas9 will cleave and that will be uh, result in the production of two bands. As you can see here, even in this agarose gel, that there are two bands here. And wherever there is a mismatch, uh, even a single base mismatch, this FN Cas9 will not detect it and this will um, actually uh, leave a single band here. And that is, uh, this can, this has been developed as a paper-based kit. So just uh, the presence and absence of a single or a double band can say whether you have the viral RNA. <coughs> and one of the advantages of this is, and one of the advantages of using <coughs> such a system is the fact that the sensitivity of this system is very, very high. Right now, again, I must mention that this has again been a case of repurposing uh, because uh, Dr. Devajati Chakrabarti was actually working on detecting, <clears throat> on making feluda for detecting <clears throat> other viruses. And moment this pandemic came on, uh, other viruses and bacteria, and the moment this pandemic came on, came on, he immediately repurposed his lab's directions towards seeing whether this uh, kit or the Feluda method can detect COVID-2. And here I show you three, uh, you know, pictures, and this is from their paper in BioArchive. Um, I would suggest that all of you should go and read this paper. Um, it's a very beautiful uh, uh, paper coming from, uh, you know, our own uh, lab uh, in the country. So in the agarose gel, as you can see, the moment there is a COVID-2, uh, you know, presence of COVID-2, you can see two bands as opposed to one band that there is no infection. Uh, he has, uh, you know, uh, tried it with the COVID-2 substrate. You can see it's uh, this is an agarose gel. That is here. It is a paper-based strip. You can see control and the test bands in this paper-based strip. And here, this is proof of principle that this can be used for COVID-19 patient samples as well. As you can see here, that there are two bands from patients who are positive for COVID-2, and uh, you know, uh, only a single band patients who do not have COVID-2 uh, infection. So, uh, I mean, newer methods are coming up. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the Tata um, uh, Sons have, you know, collaborated with CSIR and IGIB to sort of get this uh, detection assay rolling. Um, and uh, they're trying to, you know, uh, commercialize this very soon. Right. Uh, so that was all about the sort of diagnostics which exists uh, for the COVID 2019 therapy, uh, 2019. Now I will divert your attention towards some of the promising therapies and uh, some of the therapies which are uh, being flashed in the media um, on and again um, uh, in the recent past. So um, uh, again, it is all rooted in basic biology. So I keep coming back to the structure or the mode of infection. So the COVID-2019 therapies are all based on how the virus enters the uh, cells and how it causes the infection. So um, as you all know that the basic biology is that the COVID uh, uh, you know, virus uh, enters uh, utilizing the ACE2 receptor. So uh, simple therapies uh, are based on trying to block the spike protein or antibodies against this ACE2 receptor or uh, RNAi of this ACE2 receptor or uh, in fact even uh, protease inhibitor for this TMPR SS2 
uh, which is a very important, uh, you know, uh, you know, protease, which is important for the cleavage. Right. Uh, the second, um, so as I said, the second method is, is, is looking for a protease inhibitor which blocks this uh, uh, TMPRSS2 from activating the spike protein uh, via a cleavage. Of course, the third is uh, vaccinations. And today, in the interest of time, I'll not be talking about vaccinations, but I will suggest uh, to you all to sort of, uh, you know, um, look at the webinars uh, given by Professor Gagandeep Kang, uh, who is a director at, Shirt, at the TH, TSTI, uh, and she's an expert uh, ex on vaccines and vaccinations. And uh, uh, she has, uh, you know, uh, um, given webinars on what are the sort of vaccine trials or uh, happening worldwide and India. So, of course, uh, uh, the vaccination part would involve that, uh, you know, uh, use various virus. Uh, make, uh, I mean, antibodies and recognize some of these uh, infected cells or recognize some of these spike proteins, and that leads to the killing of uh, the viruses. Uh, a fourth, of course, is uh, method is the use of pro inflammatory cytokines, uh, where, you know, uh, or, or anti inflammatory molecules which can subdue the uh, secondary effect caused by this virus, which is that of, you know, uh, production of, uh, I mean, subdue the inflammatory response produced by this uh, virus. And in the coming few slides, I'll be talking about some of these therapies and uh, what are the promises uh, uh, which these hold and a little bit about uh, the biology behind these therapies, right? So as I mentioned, uh, the I mean, some of these therapies uh, could be antivirals where, you know, simply it is against the spike protein or one of the uh, uh, antivirals is against the RNA polymerase of the virus. Um, uh, some of these therapies are also based on anti-inflammatories to sort of subdue the inflammatory response. Uh, some of them target the ACE2 or the uh, protease. Uh, and uh, this targeting is either done by RNAi or the antibodies or the inhibitors. Uh, there is, of course, this uh, uh, antibody and plasma therapy, and this plasma therapy as actually, uh, you know, there are worldwide eff uh, efforts going on for this plasma therapy um, uh, because uh, many uh, uh, patients have shown successes uh, using this plasma therapy, and I'll be talking to you about it in a bit. Of course, dexamethasone, which came uh, in the news two days back, uh, this is a steroid, and again, it is uh, uh, dampening the inflammatory response in the lungs. And of course, uh, there have been uh, talks about stem cell therapy, and I'll be talking about all of this uh, uh, as some of the promising therapies, uh, you know, to tackle the COVID-2019. Uh, coming to, you know, antivirals, one of the very promising uh, antivirals, which uh, has been there uh, already being used for uh, against viruses is remdesivir and there are clinical trials which are undergoing currently to see whether remdesivir can uh, act as you know uh, you know again against SARS-CoV-2. Now this uh, simply targets the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and thus blocks uh, the viral RNA synthesis. Uh, along with this uh, you know uh, other few other promising uh, antivirals are ribavirin uh, favipiravir and galidesivir, which are nucleoside analogs, uh, which again, uh, you know, target the uh, RDRP, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and thus block viral RNA synthesis. So, antivirals are perhaps, you know, uh, directly, um, you know, targeting the first line, uh, uh, or rather the cause of this problem, which is the SARS coronavirus. Right. Now, uh, there all almost, or uh, there was almost. Uh, also in the news that chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is also a very promising therapy. Uh, this then uh, led to, you know, uh, you, uh, uh, this uh, drug being produced in mass and also this drug being uh, exported out of India and exported, um, uh, you know, elsewhere. Uh, how does this uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine work? Now, I must also mention that why some of these molecules are already uh, in uh, the reckoning because uh, they are already being used to treat uh, some of these viruses or some other diseases. So they are already being tested, safety tested. So if these can be repurposed, 
then uh, definitely uh, if, if some of them show promise, then uh, uh, I mean, we are looking at a therapy which can be immediately uh, started on human patients and really need not wait uh, till, uh, you know, a new drug is being discovered for COVID-2019. Now, how does hydroxychloroquine work is that uh, there was a study um, uh, in which it was shown that this uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine was able to effectively inhibit SARS-CoV-2 uh, in vitro. And uh, this uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, in fact, works at the very first step um, of the entry of the virus. Perhaps it is the mechanism is still not very clearly known, but perhaps what it does, it's, it prevents the endocytosis of the virus. And that's how this, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine works, and that's how it's been effective to inhibit SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there are clinical trials happening in China. There are clinical trials happening in uh, US as well uh, to see whether uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, is effective. And as I mean, only when we have, you know, the results of some of these, uh, you know, uh, 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 the trials, can we actually say whether it is effective against the SARS-CoV-2 because this is a new spike protein. Uh, it's not uh, it's not exactly same as the old SARS-CoV-1 spike protein. So some of these trials will only reveal uh, whether they are effective. So I mean, why I emphasize the fact is that, you know, uh, um, in being in the media, I mean, in the media, we see flash news that, you know, hydroxychloroquine is uh, effective therapy. But we must wait and pause. And as I mentioned in the very first slide itself, that science takes a time and uh, the general public should understand that we should give science and scientists their time so that they can come up with an effective therapy which meets the highest standards of safety, which meets the highest standards of efficacy uh, and uh, so on uh, before such uh, therapies or treatments or drugs can um, be commissioned. As I mentioned, anti-inflammatories are also being uh, used and very popular uh, are some of these JAK-STAT inhibitors which are used against uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Simply put, uh, this is uh, just to sort of dampen the secondary response uh, which the uh, immune or the host or the humans produce in their lung cells or in the lung epithelium. So it is just to, you know, sort of... Um, uh, uh, to sort of dampen that. And this is also very important because in several severe cases of COVID 2019, what we have seen is uh, this increased inflammation, which has led to, you know, accurate, ac acute respiratory distress leading to deaths uh, uh, in COVID 2019. And one uh, uh, molecule which is shown promise is baricitinib. Uh, which is an anti-inflammatory, which when used in combination with, uh, again, uh, remdesivir, uh, has shown to increase, uh, I mean, has shown to reduce uh, the viral infection and also decrease the inflammatory response. All right. Now, uh, coming to dexamethasone, uh, uh, a drug which has been made, been made popular in the last couple of days uh, by being in news. Uh, this is a steroid. Again, this is used to reduce inflammation. And the uh, uh, what has actually come out is from the clinical trials which were conducted in United Kingdom that show that, uh, and this uh, has, uh, according to a, a WHO, because we still don't ha have access to all the data, this is still very preliminary and access only by WHO, and they have meant, uh, mentioned that, you know, for patients who are on ventilators, uh, the use of dexamethasone has reduced the mortality by one third. And for patients who require only oxygen, the mortality has been reduced by one fifth. So clearly, this is a very good promise and towards the right direction uh, in, uh, in trying to reduce the inflammation um, as part of the therapy uh, for, uh, uh, you know, sars coronavirus 2 But I must hear, as a scientist mentioned, that this has been tested only on sick ICU patients. And that there is always a possibility of secondary bacterial infections uh, wherever we use steroids. So as I said, uh, we need to pause, we need to take this uh, uh, into our stride. And uh, to all of you students of biotechnology, I would suggest that, you know, it is important for you to understand the biology and sort of also important for you to understand that uh, what all regulations or what all, you know, steps need to be uh, done before we go on to even say that, you know, these will uh, 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 be sort of drugs uh, for future use. Uh, so it is important to wait for the actual results of this trial to, and to understand how if, uh, efficacious or how safe this uh, treatment is. Right. 
Uh, and in some of the other therapies, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, targeting ACE2 or the protease is also a very, you know, uh, you know, very good avenue which can be chased. And uh, uh, some of this already being chased, like RNAi against the ACE2 or the antibody or the protease inhibitor. And uh, uh, there is already a trial going on in China where you know, the recombinant human ACE2 is being overexpressed. The objective being that if you overexpress the recombinant human ACE2 in the lungs, then it will mop up all the virus and then it will leave the ACE2 receptor on the cell intact uh, so that there is now no, you know, uh, or the ACE2 receptor mops up all the virus and that can be cleared of the system and that uh, there is no, you know, internalization of the virus uh, into the uh, cells. Uh, leading to, you know, uh, uh, leading to uh, inflammatory response in the lung cells. Uh, another uh, way uh, that this is being done is by way of, you know, uh, creation of an uh, antibody uh, against the human ACE2 receptor, which can again mop or block the, you know, human ACE2 receptor, preventing the spike entry uh, into the, uh, you know, uh, uh, preventing the entry of the virus into the cell. Uh, so I must mention that, you know, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are all um, therapies which um, uh, once the infection happens, these are therapies uh, which will uh, sort of prevent uh, at every step of the way. Right. Now, uh, there is also, as I mentioned, use of uh, RNAi, um, uh, which uh, 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 which could be um, uh, 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 where you can RNA or knock down ACE2, and this has been done by a pharmaceutical company called uh, uh, Alnilam, a pharmaceutical company where they're designing RNAi to knock down the ACE2 receptor. And this study uh, here, which was very recently published in Cell, uh, where they have tested a clinically approved inhibitor uh, against um, TMPRSS2, uh, and they show very, very promising results that if you inhibit this, uh, you know, um, uh, if you use this inhibitor and block this uh, very important cleavage uh, spike protein uh, priming by the cellular proteases, you can still reduce the viral load. Uh, uh, so these are some of the very promising therapies. Um, I mean, uh, based uh, purely on uh, uh, the understanding of the biology behind how this virus infects and how this virus causes uh, the sort of uh, COVID-2019 disease. Okay, now coming to plasma therapy and antibodies. Plasma therapy world over has shown uh, promises, uh, not just in India, every state in India is reporting patients who are responding to plasma therapy. So what is this plasma therapy? Uh, the plasma therapy is basically, uh, you take from conval convalescent patients, the patients who have recovered from the SARS coronavirus infection, you take their plasma. Now plasma is simply where all the cells of the blood have been removed, namely the RBCs, WBCs, uh, everything have been removed. And what remains is uh, the plasma which contains the antibodies, uh, which, uh, which uh, from a patient who has now recovered from uh, SARS coronavirus will also include antibodies against the SARS CoV 2. So, plasma from such patients have been now, uh, you know, uh, used to treat patients who are on ventilator support. And they've been promising, uh, though, I mean, again, there are not numbers because at this pandemic, we cannot now produce statistical numbers to show, to show that, you know, this is a very effective therapy. But of course, uh, time and again, from every state and from every country, uh, this plasma therapy is showing very promising results. Uh, this plasma therapy is based on passive immunity, which, which is similar to what you would get, uh, what a fetus gets from its mother, that is antibodies crossing the placenta and going and, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving immunity to the unborn fetus. It's something very similar to that, the plasma therapy. And world over, this is, I, I must mention that this is one of the uh, biggest trials which are which is going on in US uh, using plasma therapy to treat patients, particularly who are on ventilator support. Uh, um, uh, again, uh, you can have antibodies which can directly uh, neutralize the SARS-CoV-2, the spike protein uh, specifically, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, two very recent papers in Nature show great promise, um, but again, these are not, uh, I may say, these are just, you know, starting uh, stages. We still have to rely on other therapies like anti-inflammatory because the pandemic is going at such a stage that we really need, uh, you know, therapies which can act immediately. But of course, uh, we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. So these two promising results 
suggest that you know uh, we may uh, have antibodies which can neutralize the SARS-CoV-2. For instance, this 2006 RBD, which is a specific monoclonal, uh, shows great promise, and this uh, CA1 and CB6 have been. Uh, shown to reduce the SARS-CoV-2 infection in rhesus monkeys. And these have been very recently published in the journal Nature. So uh, these are some of the therapies. Um, uh, and I, I think towards the uh, last, I would like to mention uh, about how uh, uh, you could also have mesin camel stem cell therapy. So on one, so as I mentioned, on the top is all the inflammatory response, which happens uh, once the COVID uh, SARS corona to COVID virus infects, uh, you know, the cells, uh, one of the ways in which the therapy is, of course, use of anti-inflammatory, but also one way we could do this and which is already being used for treating pulmonary, uh, being trial, be under trial for treating pulmonary fibrosis is uh, the mesen camel stem cells, uh, which uh, are taken from umbilical cord. Uh, they uh, they are the primary cells, um, stem cells, which give rise to the myofibroblasts. Uh, so if you can inject these mesenchymal stem cells into the lungs, you can fasten or you can cause, you can increase the tissue regeneration inside the lung epithelium. Uh, so one way, of course, is to use anti-inflammatories, but the other way is to inject these stem cells uh, which can also uh, sort of, you know, help uh, in tissue regeneration in these affected uh, uh, epithelial tissue and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, is a very promising therapy. But I must mention that these are all currently under trials and we really don't have any data from these uh, therapies and we really need to wait and see that how some of these therapies will play out. Uh, 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 and uh, maybe one of them can um, be a therapy uh, or perhaps vaccination uh, 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 could also be the other way in which we can tackle this pandemic. So to conclude uh, my talk today, I would say that, you know, uh, there are two, uh, I mean, besides, of course, what we have understood uh, from this pandemic uh, about why science is important or we need to now repurpose, uh, repurpose ourselves, not just uh, you know, not just scientists, but even the layman uh, has to repurpose so that you can all, uh, you know, work around this pandemic. Uh, but uh, once this pandemic has now kicked in, uh, some of the, you know, measures which uh, we must take at the country level, at the institute levels are that testing is very key to understand the spread of the pandemic. And at India now we are uh, doing testing to study how this pandemic is spreading. Uh, uh, several treatments are undergoing expedited trials and some of them show a great promise. As I mentioned to you, uh, some of them are showing results, uh, and but we really need to wait and see um, how far, uh, you know, they will be sustained and how, uh, effic um, you know, how effective these therapies will be. Uh, so is vaccination. So, but, uh, you know, uh, vaccinations routinely take about 10 to 20 years. And um, it is important here to emphasize that um, it is not uh, suggested that one must expedite vaccination because the repercussions could be huge. Uh, so again, till we have any vaccine, we should, uh, you know, some of the uh, treatments which are available uh, 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 should be explored. But uh, for now, um, I must mention that social distancing is the new normal and it's here to stay. So let's all practice social distancing uh, uh, and uh, whatever is required to sort of keep the SARS coronavirus at bay. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for your very patient listening. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope I was able to today uh, tell you some of the interesting biology between uh, behind, sorry, interesting biology behind some of these diagnostics and these therapies. Uh, and I hope, you know, uh, the approaches which you have understood today, you will use the same approach tomorrow whenever you read a news article or any journal article, research article to understand that how a therapy or, you know, how a treatment or a diagnostic, um, not just in COVID-2019, but for any disorder could be very, uh, uh, how does it work or how uh, effective it is. And uh, I must uh, thank two people. Uh, first, Professor Kannan, um, uh, first for this invitation today to give this webinar to you all. Uh, and uh, second, uh, that uh, uh, for his 
invaluable mentorship during my undergrad day, days at the Guru Gobind Singh Indrapas University. Uh, he was my professor there. And uh, I must mention uh, that one of the reasons uh, that I'm a scientist today is because of the spark which he ignited during my undergrad days at uh, Guru Gobind Singh Indrapas University. And also thanks to Rashmi uh, to sort of take care of all the technicalities which is involved uh, when you have to do a webinar uh, to ensure that, you know, uh, this uh, transmission is very smooth from my side to all of you. And I will leave you with this uh, slide uh, and uh, uh, here. Uh, so I'm, uh, I have started a neurodevelopment and stem cell lab at in STEM uh, under the theme of brain development and disease mechanisms. And my lab focuses on understanding uh, chromatin regulation of uh, nervous system development both in health and disease so we work in studying both uh, how uh, normal neurodevelopment happens and how it goes wrong in neurodevelopmental disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder uh, um, i'm uh, far removed from covid 2019 uh, but i must mention that you know um, as i said uh, 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 my institute has repurposed so so have all of us uh, in trying to understand uh, uh, or contribute from our side by doing testing or even trying to understand how this uh, disease is progressing. Uh, so I leave you with uh, my website. So if you uh, would like to access or understand what uh, research I do, uh, please uh, go to this uh, website here. This tells you about my lab um, and what I work on. And I've been generously funded by the uh, DBT Welcome India Alliance and core funds from INSTEM. And uh, this is the end of my talk, and I'll be very happy to take questions from all of you. Thank you so much. Hi, Rashmi, was it uh, OK? Oh, thank you, Bhavna. Uh, okay. It's a really very nice presentation, and uh, we came to know many new things from uh, your uh, presentation. Like you uh, gave a very good information related to the testing techniques, the different te testing techniques which are available nowadays, and uh, what are the different therapies also available. So uh, here I uh, remember one proverb from Joseph Conrad. He, he stated once, he said, he who wants to persuade should put his trust not in right argument, but in right word, the power of sound has always been greater than power of self. And in this way, we can say that in uh, our country is trying hard to get appropriate drug at uh, this point of time. And uh, you researchers are really putting hard and giving us information what is happening nowadays. So I will put uh, the question to you later on. First, I want to call Professor Kanan sir uh he is chair professor in our department as well as he is covid uh, uh, chairman covid in covid task force so uh kanan sir uh, now you are welcome you please throw some light and uh, um, give us provide us some valuable uh, thoughts to our students to our researchers to our faculty uh, sir over to you sir yeah, thank you, uh, Rashmi. Uh, uh, Bhavna, it was Hi, nice sir. to sit and <laughs> it was lovely hearing you because I've new, known you now for 21 years. Uh, thank you so much, sir. As a, as a young girl, you came to study biotechnology with all the enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, what more does a teacher want? You know, it was a gift listening to you. And I'm really touched and I'm very happy that. Uh, you have chosen a track and you are doing I think uh, some of the highlights, if I were to say, is, you know, you, you seem to be a very good teacher. Because the way you put across things in a very simple language, I'm sure um, it made a big impact on this thing. Number two, I wish you had spent some more time on mesenchymal stem cells and clone, yeah. but I think since you were trying to give a general overview, I'm sure, you did not have enough time to speak on that, right. which is more your forte than the rest of them. In the sense of, you know, having worked on stem cells, you know what it is. And interestingly, when I look back, you were the first batch where we introduced stem cell as a subject, if you remember, way back in 1999 when I made syllabus. 
and uh, I'm happy that uh, we started that program and uh, uh, I, I still remember the practicals you did for your juniors, you know, how you designed, you and Anjana sat and designed the practicals because we couldn't do these experiments in the lab and uh, you, you know, we taught the students how Till and Matlock did their work or Metcalf did his work. You know, I think it was a great experiment and I still feel that um, these are as much relevant today as it was then. But uh, coming to the main talk, I liked the one which I was very impressed because you spend a lot of time explaining the statistical way to reduce the cost of it. Yes. You, know, you brilliantly demonstrated it mm, uh, because that is a uh, that is a crux of the thing. You know, everybody right. cries the test cost four thousand five hundred rupees, yes. but here you know, having pulled several samples and then Correct. testing it, and yeah. you know, I think I think that is the right statistical approach. So I think that uh, that was something you beautifully illustrated. I think that is what highlight of your talk is bringing that number Thank two, you, which I'm. Us, eh? No, no, thank you so much. I, I think I must mention here that this is beautiful work from, uh, you know, uh, from our collaboration from our institute and uh, IIT Madras. So, uh, yeah, and uh, I think because we, op I mean, we started doing testing, we started thinking about how to go for these, some of these pooling methods so that the cost could be reduced. I think, I think it's the because I used to talk of this, uh, you know, 30, 35 years ago when I was, yeah. was in Surat with span diagnostics, you know, uh, because HIV was at that time we were talking like because the percentage of people affected are so small that you can pull the samples and then reduce the number of tests. This is how the whole concept came those days, I remember. Uh, yeah. But I'm glad you spent time, you know, because that was very important for children to know that uh, there are smarter methods when the probability yes. of the disease is very low Pooling of the sample helps us a lot. Correct. Number yeah. two, it also will tell us about community spreading also. Right. Because in community spreading is there, you know, it will immediately, this method may not help you very much. Correct. So That's immediately, you know, the look at a spread. So from that point of view, I would still say there is no community spread as of now. Mm -hmm. You know, from the data, what you were presenting, if I'm right to conclude, I think that is something important. Yes, I mean, uh, I, so, I mean, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, just to give you numbers, I, I think uh, what we are looking at is a per million of, you know, uh, population, we're looking at about 8.6 to 10 cases. Uh, and our tests are now adequate uh, because we are doing, so the WHO suggests that our tests should be 10 times of this. So we are doing currently about 100 tests uh, per case. And I mean, we've done about 5 million testing till now. So we are sort of adequate, uh, adequately testing for now. Uh, but I think once the pandemic spreads, I think, and we're also now gearing up to increase our testing uh, to, you know, uh, to, for instance, like some countries are even doing uh, uh, not just 10 times, but even 100 times per case, uh, number of tests per case. So, uh, I mean, yeah, we are doing well. I think we should just be, and we're also geared because uh, um, I'm uh, at, at, at a testing center, right? So I, we do, we are gearing up the state and the country is gearing up to do uh, more tests uh, to understand community spreading or to understand how the pandemic is spreading in the country. Exactly. I think it's yeah. beautifully illustrated. I think I must compliment you for stressing on that, you know, because these are basic things, you know, because people are saying it's so yeah. expensive, we can't do it. And yeah. here you come out with that, you know, per test actually falls down dramatically. Uh, yeah. um, number two, I like the way you talked about Feluda because yeah. I know both Cervic uh, very well and, okay. and uh, I'm very proud like you are that it has also come out of our own country, our own scientific community rising to the occasion, I think. And you beautifully illustrated that part of it. Uh, you know, these are the two things which struck me most from your lecture, you know, that you are acknowledging the good work of others in the country, which is very, very important. And number two, how your institute, you, your people, as well as NCBS has got together and sp uh, decided to spend certain major amount of your time on this and sort of sacrificing a little bit of, 
of your main research, which is, I think, which is admirable. I think you are rising to the occasion, and I think it's a good impression for you know the youngsters to know that we can't be selfish all the time, but we should rise to the occasion because the country needs more testing center. Interestingly, I was also very happy that you know your juniors are also involved in this. I know Amit Tuli is doing it in Chandigarh. You know. Yeah. Uh, Vinay Bolusu is doing in Barampur. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm very proud that, uh, you know, I, IP University alumni are also participating in a national endeavor. I think it's very commendable and I feel proud as a teacher that uh, you people are doing. Uh, only thing, uh, you know, I know you co you covered and it's not possible to cover everything, but I just wish uh, you had made a comment on, on um, you know, sequencing. For example, say virus is available. Okay. Today yeah. you can yeah. do sequencing very fast, Correct. Correct. Uh, Correct. you know, and especially with this Oxford nanopore claims and all that. Uh, I wish you can just spend two minutes on trying to talk about. Will that also help us to do confirm that it is a virus and not some false positive or false? Can you just illustrate that? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, sequencing is the go to method or the final final method to confirm that the virus exists. Uh, and in fact, in India, um, uh, uh, 42 uh, genomes have been sequenced. Uh, I mean, not just confirmation. I think um, uh, I would put it like this, that uh, for testing right now, the RT-PCR based method is sort of uh, really, really very effective. Uh, 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 given the, you know, the way we are able to predict uh, false positives or uh, uh, negatives and so on. Uh, but the sequencing, um, um, the sequencing costs are still uh, much, much higher than the RT-PCR cost. But the sequencing is very useful. Uh, our own uh, institute is going to now uh, sequence the genomes, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. Now, why this is useful is that once we sequence, now we all understand this is an RNA virus and this is mutating. And world over uh, uh, genome sequence have shown that the, you know, uh, the isolate from China is different. It's mutated in USA. Even in India, uh, the 42 genomes we have sequenced, we have, uh, we have mutations which clearly show that there are three waves of the pandemic. First wave which came from, which came from Europe, the second which came from Middle East and the third which came from South Asian. And we're able to glean so much information from just sequencing. So it is very important to sequence and we are, uh, uh, I mean, we're seeing mutations in the spike protein, we're seeing mutations in the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So this is all valuable information for us to understand and probably even predict how this pandemic will play out, uh, not just globally, but specifically in India, how this is going to go about. So I think sequencing is very important, uh, though, I mean, because of course, it's not the go to method, but clearly um, I think it things are in place that every testing center should do their own sequencing to see uh, what is the sort of mutations or the variance which is present uh, across the Indian uh, patient sample pool. But from the sequence point of view, you yeah. said so many therapies. Hmm. Will these therapies uh, be successful in all the type of mutations which is happening? Yeah, so uh, that's that's very, very, uh, very, very good question. And in fact, uh, uh, and that's why I think, uh, you know, uh, some of these therapies which is targeting the spike protein or, you know, uh, targeting uh, the uh, uh, spike protein, because if the spike protein mutates, then any uh, antibody or anything is not going to be effective. So um, I think uh, that's why we, uh, um, uh, and I, I wanted to give that flavor today in my talk that it's just not one uh, line of uh, therapy, which is important, but we must now start to, you know, look at other forms also. Uh, something which could, some therapies uh, target the spike protein, uh, some are the, against the antivirals, uh, 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 which may or may not work as you rightly put because of the mutation. But of course, we are also have therapies which target the host cell, and that is like you know sort of uh, standard or common. For instance, ACE2, uh, uh, the in protease inhibitor sounds like a very good promise, uh, uh, which can be used. And also some of these anti-inflammatories, like it may not affect the cause, but it is doing a lot to the effect of you know uh, it it will uh, go in a long way to. Um, uh, sort of uh, decrease the load, the respiratory uh, stress burden on the patient. So I, I think uh, uh, we must 
follow every therapy and uh, i think you should wait and watch how each therapy could be useful because in the end we may not have one therapy but we may have a mix of these and already we are seeing people mixing jack stat inhibitors and the antivirals to sort of come up with a more effective therapy uh, precisely because the virus is mutating so you are talking of a multi pronged attack rather uh, than a single, single rather solution. than a single single solution last question i would like to ask because i am taking too much of the time that there is so much excitement about herbal products yes i cleared the hype is there. cleared from now, i <laughs> for an average man you know yeah. what is your reaction as a scientist that are we justified in this excitement because they claim that um, you know some of the herbal products are similar to this methadone type of structure you know or haldi has lot of steroids you know i hear all kinds of stories being said so why don't you take it daily that might you know help you not to get covid and all that would you like to make any comment on that i will only say this as a scientist that you know uh, for us to say that this is a potent drug molecule we need to uh, do it the scientific way we need to come up with a hypothesis and say this drug herbal product or whatever does this we need to show in vitro in vivo studies we need to do the whole rigmarole till we claim that this drug is an antiviral or is you know has steroid like properties uh, uh, for instance i remember that you know curcumin from turmeric has been shown to have anti cancer properties uh, and like that so till we show that you know this any drug uh, is uh, is is good enough I, i think i will reserve my comment on whether how good the herbal drugs are but i will also say this that uh, turmeric is a traditional uh, it's tk it's traditional knowledge in the country and i mean our grandmothers have been using tr- turmeric for hundreds of years we been eating turmeric in all our food and everything uh there is no harm in continuing it but if you would ask me to comment on whether you know it is effective i would say that still there is uh, it is done in a proper rigorous scientific way we cannot conclude that but uh, our traditional knowledge is our traditional knowledge so uh, as long as it's safe to uh, use and it is not uh, causing any uh, side effects I'm, i mean i would say go for things like turmeric i have a lot of turmeric at i mean i eat my food i i take a lot of turmeric so if i'm being protected because of it so uh, well and good <laughs> that's true as a last question i because a lot of students of btech background sitting yeah. or there may be some who plan to take biotech you having been through this journey of doing a btech then an mtech then a phd and etc in this field what is your advice to a young child, you know biotechnology who aspiring to become a biotechnologist yeah uh, uh, i mean i my advice uh, would be that you know um um i i think some things were different uh, uh, probably uh, uh, when i was doing my btech i i think the emphasis was a lot on basic research um i mean ha- and in the last 20 years i've seen the shift going from basic research to translational research so what i'm trying to come at is that uh, as a young biotechnologist if you if you are interested in research i i would like to say that you know uh, there is no fixed uh, uh, things of doing research today you can do it in the academia you can do it in the industry uh, you know and uh, the shift is going towards you uh, you know uh, doing translational uh, science uh, but i would say that even if it's translational science it is all rooted in basic biology so at this juncture what you should really see is whether does understanding basic biology interest you or not uh if you you know understand basic biology well uh, you sort of study your basic biochemistry or basic molecular biology and all those things well and then depending on your interest you can always go on and say no i would still like to continue basic research um because that interests me because that is going to uh, produce novel things and uh, novel ideas or you may say no i have done my basic biology study i would want an application for it uh, in the academia you can do it in uh, translational science in the academia or suddenly you decide no i would want to directly jump in towards the other end of making drugs i want to do it in the industry so uh, you can do it so i think what you should be really rooted right 
right now is to keep your basic concepts of basic biology or understanding of all that very clear now so that you know in the future uh, whatever it is that you want to do you can uh, go forth and shine in that thank you uh, bhavna now, yeah. now i hand over to rashmi thank you once again yeah, yeah thank you thank you bhavna and uh, sir for uh, bringing a very uh, nice discussion and hope our student will get benefited with your discussion uh, with your questions as far as we know that basic research is very very much required very well said bhavna without basic research one cannot uh, apply thinking one cannot proceed in application part unless and until he he has developed a thought process for doing something which is uh, required at that particular time so basic research is very very much required and uh, uh, definitely it is suggested to, to our student community uh, that uh, uh, while studying you should put emphasis on uh, your uh, basic course basic uh, materials which which is being taught so this will help you in further so now coming to our uh, question uh, answer session uh, uh, bhavna we have many questions from our faculty as well as students and researchers who are now participants so one by one i would like to bring out all those um, the very first question from my side is bhavna that suppose if a person gets infected um, uh, with one clad and uh, then he treated can he get back the infection uh, from uh, with another clad so um, that's a very good question theoretically yes but i would like to base it still on uh, because we already have information from sars and mers right which are similar corona viruses now one one thing about the rna viruses is that the fact is that this rna pol2 i i think the rna dependent rna polymerase is the culprit here because it doesn't have proofreading activity and that's why uh, you know we have mutations uh, uh, happening in these some of these rna viruses but we are also seeing that some of these mutations are not uh, you know uh, it, it all depends on where the mutation is right now if the mutation is not in the spike protein and it is one of the nucleocapsid proteins that's no way going to affect uh, if our therapy is going is if the way this you know uh, it's uh, going to infect or not so it is i i would say that theoretically you're right when uh, you know uh, if you get infected with clad 1 you produce antibodies you have another clad you can again get infected but uh, we must also understand that these are complex things and it all depends on you know where the mutation is uh, uh, to which epitope was the antibody produced uh, so all that will determine how you're going to fight the infection in the second case so i think it is important uh, i mean i always exercise caution we must wait and watch uh, how some of these reinfection case reinfection cases which are emerging in china and other parts of the world how they are emerging uh, we need to really look at that data question is if infection rises then chance of mutation is high is it so i i don't know i don't know infection rises chance of mutation is high. i i must say that you know i'm not an expert in this field uh, mm -hmm. to uh, and uh, yeah I, as i said my expertise is uh, neurobiology but of course we are all risen to the occasion so uh, yeah we don't know we don't know and also i think uh, if this virus has also shown one thing that you know there are several things which is not known about the virus even to scientists perhaps if you were to ask this to a virologist i think he may also uh, probably say the same with a word of caution that we don't know let's see how the pandemic pans out uh there is one another question yeah. uh, from our viewer uh, he wants to know how the threshold value of real time pcr is determined so we have positive and negative controls in the uh, qpcr setup 
uh, where we know that with certain copies which can be detected, uh, copies of the viral genome which can be actually detected from the nasal swab, we know what is the range in which the threshold comes. So uh, the least uh, amount of uh, viral to the maximum load, uh, we have set, set up a certain threshold and this threshold uh, is determined empirically by every testing center and that's why I said that when I said a CT value of 40, it is just a number, it is not the right one because every testing center before it sets up, sets some of these values that what is the least number of copies I can detect to uh, the uh, 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 using my uh, testing kit or you know anything. So uh, th that's how they set, uh, you know, that with the positive control that in this range, if I see a CT value, then I have the virus, otherwise it is not. And 40 is just a number I gave you, uh, even at our own testing center, if you use a new kit, we change the uh, threshold, we always recalibrate it from time to time. Uh, one of our MSc student, uh, Ms. Riddhi, she asked uh, uh, if uh, IgM and IgG and it, uh, are generated when a person gets uh, the COVID infection, so do these patients have memory cells also made and are they now immune to the virus? Uh, sorry, I I forget my immunology. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't think I can answer that. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it must. I think it's it's like any other. I mean, I'm just hazarding a guess. So uh, correct me if there is an immunologist in the uh, in one of your faculty. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I'm sure there'll be memory cells which will be made. I'm, I'm not very. I'm very vague on the details. So. Mm -hmm. So one of our student, BTS student Rudra, he wants to ask why it is hard to detect corona in asymptomatic patients. Why uh, suppose we perform testing and uh, like uh, RT-PCR and kind of thing is not able to detect this kind of cause? Uh, still not understood but I think perhaps a simple answer would be that the moment there is this first viral challenge the body is able to fight it the immune system is able to fight it and reduces the viral load so that's why when people uh, you know uh, who are asymptomatic who may have got it even in their you know uh, swabs we are not able to detect because the viral load as soon as so it is, it's this ability, it's like a tug, it's, it's this war between the immune system and the virus. The one which wins uh, and by how much margin that determines the viral load. So if your immune system is really good and that's why people suggest that, you know, uh, uh, immunity is very key in this. Uh, so people with good immune system are able to fight off and that's why we are not able to detect it in the system. Uh, another question from Dr. Uh, uh, our Professor Joseph, uh, he wants to know regarding rate of COVID-19 patient is more than uh, regarding uh, the treatment rate of COVID-19 patients is more than 50%. Is there any data on genetic specially related to target genes responsible for respiratory diseases or metabolic genes? Um, sorry, I didn't get the question. So uh... Uh, once again, I'm repeating. Yeah. Uh, uh, regarding rate of COVID-19 patients is mm -hmm. more than 50% uh, that got treated. Is there any data on genetic so, specially related uh, to target genes responsible for respiratory disease? Gene? So, so if I may, para, uh, I mean, rephrase the question. Is it that his question is that people who have recovered from the disease is more than 50%? Uh -huh. Is uh -huh. that, if I'm understanding correctly, that Yes, uh, yes. So has there been a systematic study uh, of, you know, what are the gene expression changes in those uh, uh, patients? I yes, mean, that's yes. a really nice idea, I would say. I think, uh, mm -hmm. of course, some of these labs may be uh, uh, doing such systematic studies to understand that, you know, who are yes. recovered, how did they recover? I mean, that's clearly, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a very important next question to ask. Because right now, I mean, the moment we stuck with pandemic, the first response is, was of course to do testing, to you know, repurpose drugs and all of that. But clearly, I mean, going forth, I think these are some of the very important questions we should ask, particularly in patients who have recovered that, you know, um, yeah, uh, what could be the gene expression changes and all of that. Means to say that any uh, genetic specially related target genes data is available or not uh, at this point of time. I'm, so, I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware of it. If, if it is, I don't know. 
I, I don't know. So another question he has, uh, any specific data is available to say BCG vaccine gives protection because it was very much in news uh, earlier that he, yes. he, people are uh, given so many of vaccines and uh, mm, uh, might be there is some role people are coming with asymptomatic uh, uh, functions. They are not uh, exhibited. Correct, correct. But I think it, uh, it, I mean, it was just a news. I think uh, we don't have enough data to suggest. Now, given the sort of way the infections are rising in the country, uh, I mean, unless and until we do this very systematic study of people who were vaccinated, how, what were their response to COVID 2019, I'm sure I'm, I, I'm not going to hazard a guess or, you know, say anything about it. Uh, it, it I, as I said, I mean, uh, I think... Uh, of all times, this is the time to understand that what we must uh, take it at face value and what we must really probe into. So I think if there is any base to this, this has to be done systematically, looking at people who got the BCG vaccination to how their COVID 2019 response was. I think it will be done eventually, but right now we are too, uh, you know, overwhelmed or rather too, you know, uh, sort of focused on trying to see how the pandemic spreading, what can be the first line of treatment and all of that. So uh, we have another question from uh, our faculty, Dr. Soma. She wants to know with kits like Faluda, why is it the kit is still not in market as it provides rapid detection method in a very short span of time? And the kit is also cheaper uh, as far as compared to RT-PCR. Can you throw some light here? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, as we say, the kit is being currently uh, in process of being uh, uh, talks are on. But very important, we must understand that uh, for any diagnostic kit to step up, we need to understand that what is the sort of false positive rate or the false negative uh, rate with that kit. And till we actually uh, do a small pilot study, I mean, study with this kit, with actual COVID-19. So the paper which I presented had probably three or four patients, but that's never enough to say that this kit is very effective. On the other hand, we have the RT-PCR based method, which has been tried and tested. The last time SARS, MERS happened. This is the method where worldwide everybody's been using. So many million tests have been done with this test and it's proven time and again that it's 98% uh, 98 98 accurate in uh, saying the positivity. So till such tests are being done for, I mean, these are promising things where, you know, uh, uh, it looks very promising, but of course we need the numbers to uh, rally behind it or say that this is the go-to kit now. So we need to do a very pilot study. I am sure those studies are being commissioned and we'll soon uh, we'll get to know about these some of these trials where, uh, you know, even uh, maybe with some 10,000 patients, if you're able to say, uh, uh, what is a false positive or false negative uh, with that kit? I'm sure uh, such data will be very useful to say whether uh, can this be the next go to diagnostic method. So, our uh, another uh, uh, faculty, Dr. Silpa, she wants to know uh, whether. Uh, there is in news that the Corona front warriors are being administered with a hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic. Is it true? Can you throw some light here? I also heard about it. I, I don't know if it is true. Uh, but as I said, uh, he, uh, I mean, it's an anti-malarial. We still don't know how it works. We only know that it probably inhibits the endocytic pathway by which so it is like, you know, the virus or any uh, other vi coronavirus or any other virus is using the same mechanisms in the body, like the endocytic pathway, the clathrin mediated endocytic pathway to come inside the cell. Mm -hmm. So what we are now trying to see is whether we can block that pathway using this hydroxychloroquine and whether that can work. Now, till we test it out on, you know, actual patients who have the SARS coronavirus 2 infection, we cannot say whether this is a good measure. And... Uh, whether it has been, there were talks of ICMR, uh, I mean, I remember this, that ICMR did suggest that it could be used as a prophylactic, purely because one good thing about some of these drugs is because they're repurposed, which means their safety trials are already been conducted. 
So I think there was some mention of ICMR saying this, but I didn't follow up on that. I, I'm not sure whether this was really mandated and people on frontline uh, workers really were taking this pill. So as I said, there are two things like one is trying to repurpose. So they already safety has been done, so you can probably take them. But the thing is whether it will be really be effective, that only time will say whether such measures will be effective. So she is having another question. Yes. Uh, Dr. Shilpa wants to know, are any specific protease inhibitors has been discovered till date? Uh, any small molecules you can So say. that uh, uh, the paper which has come out very recently in cell, they are using a protease inhibitor. Though it is a clinically uh, tested one, I think, but I don't know the, I mean, it's all protected. So I don't know uh, which inhibitor is this. So that the, the one that's been tested, yes, um, uh, it, it's been published. And I think very soon it will go into trials or at least some uh, sort of preclinical trial as well. Uh, our uh, one faculty, another faculty, Dr. Kapila, she is having a very nice question. Why mm -hmm. some viruses change their host when they are very host specific? Is it related with evolution or some molecular mechanism? have role to play in this? Clearly, yes, yes, I think because uh, uh, all these viruses have zoonotic origin and uh, the work of Professor Sheng Li and China, I think she is the pioneer in doing such studies where she actually goes into the caves, uh, the Shiatic Shiatic cave, caves or some caves in China uh, to study uh, the zoonotic origin of, uh, of these viruses. Uh, I mean, yeah, they, I mean, what you're seeing is evolution and uh, uh, we're still trying to, you know, uh, piece together that how you, uh, how mutation, certain mutations are adapting the virus to sort of switch the host from bat or to pangolin to say humans. That I think we, uh, we, we uh, uh, this I think, yeah, that, that needs to be understood very well. Uh, given that, you know, uh, there's so many theories floating around that the Wuhan market uh, perhaps was one of the uh, places where this switch happened. So, uh, uh, I mean, clearly, I think this is a live human experiment. Now, I think several such questions and answers will tumble out uh, from this pandemic. And one of them, of course, the evolution and how it switches hosts. So, yeah, I mean, I look forward to the answer and I, I think I follow on the work of uh, Professor Sheng Li and see how uh, she addresses these questions and answers. So another question again she is having so many therapies we have nowadays. Uh, use of aptamer has not been uh, mentioned in therapies where we can put uh, aptamers in antivirals. Is it possible like uh, uh, we can use this uh, as a aptamer can be used as an antiviral. Yeah, I, I uh, the promise, I mean, I would mention this, that I have not come across any aptamer based uh, thing, uh, though if it exists, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I didn't come across it, across such uh, use of aptamers. But I must mention that aptamers have been tried for other uh, diseases. And uh, um, I think many of them have not sort of crossed the clinical trial barrier. So that's why the, um, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, actamers had their limelight days and then they died out. Um, uh, what is really in now are some of these SIRNA, uh, RNAi based methods or even uh, uh, antisense oligonucleotides. Uh, uh, I, I think that could be another avenue uh, to uh, uh, see how we can down regulate the viral uh, genes. So can you throw some light uh, uh, on any trial conducted with ACE inhibitors like Captrol, Pril and uh, uh, Ilana Pril? Uh, the question from Dr. Joseph, he wants to know, is there any kind of trial conducted uh, with ACE inhibitors? Um, I think so. I, I don't remember, as I said, this is not my area of expertise, so uh, I'm, I'm not too, um, I mean, maybe there is, I'm not sure. That's my answer. I'm, maybe there is. So there is, people are trying several kind of ACE inhibitors and everything. So uh, it's all underway. So, I mean, once we have the results, we'll know how they fared.
our next question is from dr manu solanki uh, she has asked very good question apart from chemotherapy what is the way of uh, naturotherapy in treatment of this covid she has asked uh, homeopathy and unyudani has effective in prevention of corona virus is it so uh, I mean, I, I, I think my answer is going to be the same to what Kanan sir asked that how do you think uh, some of these, uh, you know, um, uh, herbal therapies or um, how, how they work. I, I would say that, you know, for us to conclude uh, that some of these do what they do, we need to follow the strict scientific procedure of, you know, having the numbers some patients of knowing what the uh, exact drug molecule, what it affects, the pathways and all of that. But uh, I mean, if some of these are tested and being used uh, as traditional knowledge, then there's no harm in continuing. Like, for instance, I see no harm in uh, having turmeric or even, uh, you know, um, uh, ginger or, you know, uh, jeera and all of that. That's my uh, regular diet. And if it's, it's protecting me, so be it. Why not? So is there any, uh, you can say that uh, apart from this natural therapy, do we, uh, ha we can say that uh, exercises also play a role like breathing exercise, like in this Corona case, our lungs is getting affected. So Absolutely. if we do uh, some breathing exercise, we, uh, uh, you can say that uh, we put some regular uh, regularity in this breathing exercise. So is it going to help us? So there are enough studies to show that exercises are uh, very, very important for immune system, uh, for good immunity. So clearly, yes, any disease, not just, you know, coronavirus, but any disease uh, for us to fight, I think it's a very important to exercise. And uh, perhaps also some of these breathing exercises are known to, you know, sort of increase the lung capacity, which may help in, in sort of, you know, addressing the respiratory distress part of the coronavirus too. So yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I, I think it's very, uh, it would be the right way to go. Uh, there is another question from Dr. Sabia. She wants to know, is there, uh, this COVID-19 is, uh, infection is making us prone to other bacterial infection. So Dr. Sabia wants to know the answer. Is, is it like so? Yes, it is known that uh, uh, there are known, uh, this known to cause secondary uh, 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 bacterial infections as well in some cases. Uh, that adds to the uh, respiratory distress. Uh, one student uh, I have and uh, she is Basundhara from MSC. Uh, she has a question. Uh, she says that she ha she have read about one infected person cannot spread after nine days of quarantine. That is uh, so on the ninth day spreading is not promoted by infected person. Is it uh, true? Um, sorry, could you just repeat the question? Uh, what was it that? Uh... Uh, the question is that one infected person cannot spread the uh, contamination after ninth day of quarantine. Is it so? After I, ninth day. Okay, I'm not sure because uh, uh, typically uh, the quarantine lasts for 14 days and even upwards of 14 days. So the only way to know that you are free of the coronavirus is by doing a test. So, I mean, I, I don't think uh, this is uh, this is correct because uh, whether 9th or 14th day, even uh, when it is said that you are uh, free now uh, and free of the virus, it is a test is being done to ascertain that. So, till we do a test, uh, RT-PCR based test or anything, we, we cannot say whether that's true. Oh, we cannot challenge that it is a correct uh, that correct. after keeping uh, one person for nine days for days quarantine no. we cannot uh, spread the infection no so we another... can only ascertain that only when we do the test and say you are virus free not yes. not before that yeah so uh, we have another question from this is i think the last question from our uh, student uh, community uh, he is a uh, virudra from bitech biotechnology 
Hmm. He wants to know that uh, in asymptomatic patient, many might be possible that antibodies are developed. So, can we isolate those antibodies and uh, uh, use as a prominent uh, therapy for uh, the infected patient? Can, yes, that, uh, yeah, that's the plasma therapy which I talked about, and it has been uh, you know worldwide. I think US is doing a very large. trial to see how plasma therapy is uh, could be used for patients particularly who are on ventilator support so basically they isolate plasma from conve uh, convalescent patients patients who have recovered and uh, they are using it to treat uh, patients who are on ventilator support and uh, there are very very uh, though again uh, yeah uh, i mean uh, like very recently also in karnataka it was reported that the plasma therapy worked for a patient who was on ventilator support uh so uh, now coming to end of our today's session uh, i would like to thank you dr bhavna for uh, giving us a uh, nice information a very important information related to this uh, covid and uh, we can say that ki definitely this is a very challenging time but Correct. efforts are uh, being made by the scientists and uh, so uh, definitely we will come up with this with some conclusion with some treatment process in coming days uh, so many many thank you dr bhavna for joining us as we can say that this covid has uh, lessen our the distance though you are putting up in ncbs bangalore now and uh, we uh, can hear you from long distance our students our participants our viewers across india got benefited from your valuable uh, lecture so uh, once again i thank you from bottom of my heart our department of biotechnology and uh, our covid task force member all from uh, other side also i thank you uh, for joining us for giving us valuable information related even uh, you have shared the website address hope our student will get benefited from this in future if they want to join uh, the research process in future so once again i want to thank you uh, krishna murthy sir uh, for uh, introducing bhavna to us and uh, we uh, came to know so many information from her uh, even i want to thank uh, uh, dr sarita she is dean research and uh, all our biotechnology faculty i want to thank dr manu solanki she is hod biotechnology and uh, all our faculty members who continuously uh, um, supporting this uh, process for organizing the webinar uh, hope this uh, uh, webinar series uh, this was the last lecture of this series hope all of uh, us got benefited from this series and uh, i want uh, to urge to all participants that i have shared a feedback form uh, i would like to just Spare one or two minutes to fill those form and uh, reward. Uh, only just you fill. Automatically, it will come to me. So link already has been shared to all. Uh, just you put your uh, suggestions. So in future, again, if we organize this kind of webinar, I can shout out. I can put those uh, uh, lack which uh, was not uh, uh, used this time, or uh, we can. better bring this uh, lecture series in some uh, other way so thank you once again all of you and uh, thank you bhavna once again thank you so much it was an uh, honor and privilege to have presented this today to your students and uh, yeah thank you so much so with this uh, i want to end up today's uh, session and uh, hope uh, all of uh, us uh, all of you have joined this session all of us uh, have enjoyed this session and uh, you have grabbed many knowledge from this session thank you viewers thank you attendees thank you uh, all uh, faculty students as well as dr bhavna and uh, kanan sir for joining us thank you